Today is July 9th, 2010. I am Karen Aronson. We are talking this morning with Daniel E. Hastings, Dean for Undergraduate Education at MIT and a Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Engineering Systems. He earned a master's degree and PhD in that department after completing his undergraduate education as a math major at Oxford University in 1976. From 1997 to 99, he served as chief scientist to the U.S. Air Force. After he returned to MIT, he was associate director, co-director, and director of MIT's engineering systems division before becoming dean. Dan, thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you. On one of your websites, you mentioned that your favorite book is Lincoln on Leadership, Executive Strategies for Tough Times. What makes it your favorite book? Well, it, it, he was a great president, and the book is short, and it's pithy, and it has lots of insights that if you read some of the history of Lincoln, you realize he was actually using some of these things, you know, as he was making decisions. And what were obviously tough times, you know, for, for the country and, and for him. So I, I've often used some of those because I like it. It's a quick read. Uh, but I said knowing history, because one of my interests is actually history, right? So knowing history, you realize, boy, now I understand what he was doing, right? How did you come across this book? Oh, I think somebody recommended it to me. Who, who, know, who knows about my interest in history? Because it, it actually is a combination of two things, right? I mean, it, it's got interesting history in it, but it also has got basically management and leadership uh, techniques in it, right? And, you know, and given the current job, the jobs I've had, I need to have a lot of those, right? Are you interested in management? books generally? Are there other ones you've come across that, that you like also? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I've, I've read quite a few of what you might call leadership books. I mean, how is it that you, you think about leadership and how do you go about it, you know, and you know, and so on, right? So, yeah, I, I try to keep up with that kind of reading. Um, among, among the other kinds of reading, I'm also simultaneously, you know, trying to do. Which includes, um, beside your Aero and Astro and... Uh, well, actually, late, lately I've been reading a lot of social science about education, you know. Um, I'm actually currently reading uh, Christensen's book about in innovations in education and uh, disruptions. He's a business in school professor at yeah. the river. All right. <laughs> disruptions in education. Uh, I, 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 I've, been, I've been reading a number of books about how is it that uh, minority students are being treated in, in uh, you know, elite colleges, you know, following the Bowen and Box study, you know, on, on the shape of the river, actually, right. So, I mean, I've been reading a lot of those kind of books because I need to understand what's, what's going on in a number of different places. Right? Have there been any surprises as you've read them or things you've learned where you've said, hmm, that really helps frame something? No, no. This, I, I, actually, unfortunately not, at least in that particular case, because or, you know, what the issues that we see here at MIT, basically we see them across the landscape of elite higher education. So in that sense, there have not been surprises, right? With, so. I mean, all it tells me is that we're dealing with sets of issues which, you know, lots of other people are seeing. You know, and actually by working together, maybe we can actually help each other. Are you going to write a book? <laughs> I, I've had in my mind for a long time to, to write a book. I, I, I've written a scholarly book, you know, which is in the nature of scholarly books is, you know, not, not got a huge following. But, but about engineering or about education? No, 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 about, about engineering, about my research discipline. So I, I wrote that several years ago, and actually, I, I've had in my mind a couple of science fiction stories to write that I've just never got around to doing it. I keep looking to see if somebody else has come up with the same ideas yet, but not yet. Right? <laughs> You're uh, willing to share any? <laughs> no, 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 because I will write them one day. Right? Have you ever tried writing a science fiction story? No, but I read a lot of science fiction. Right? You have a favorite author? Well, uh, I, I think actually Asimov over the years has done some really, really good stuff. So I've read a, a great deal of the Asimov. Uh, you know, writings, right? And then I, I like I like Star Trek, you know, books. One of his know. nephews was a classmate here in the 60s. I didn't realize that. I think ah. he's a math professor on the West Coast now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so tell us about some of the skills or strategies that, that the Lincoln book describes um, and how they apply to your job now as Dean for Undergraduate Education or, or to the jobs you've held before that. So up? yeah, yeah. So he, here's one that I, I've actually used repeatedly. One of the things he did was 
when when things upset him, and of course, he had a job where lots of things upset him, right? Uh, and you know, he had people around him who, uh, in his opinion, didn't perform. You know, he he would he would write a letter. I mean, those this was before email or anything, right? He would write a letter, uh, usually to some general about what they should do or what you know hadn't been performing, and then he would put it in his desk, and he'd re he overnight. And then the next day, he'd reflect on whether he should send it or not. And about half the time he sent it, about half the time he didn't. But by writing the letter, immediately it got his feelings out, you know, and his advice out. And then he decided later on, when he had a chance to cool down, what he should do. So I, I've done that, you know. I, 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 when I get things, I don't write letters in that sense, but, but you know, I, by the various means which I communicate, when I, there's a lot of things going on that I... Uh, you know, and, and things aren't necessarily going well. I will deliberately say I'm going to just going to stop now. I mean, I I have actually written long emails to people about what they should or should not do, and not sent them. You know, <laughs> right? Not even by mistake. Not even by mistake. <laughs> I just put them into draft. I mean, I'm very careful about what goes out of that, and sometimes I just get rid of them because you know, I don't need to say that anymore. Right? So I mean, that was that's that's deliberately a strategy that, that he used. Right? And here's here's another way he. he he, he points out, actually this is in the book, that uh, you, know, you don't need to respond to everything. Right? So he said, you know, nine times out of ten, if you just wait, other people will figure out what, what, what to actually do. So I don't always respond immediately to what you know, people bring me. And very often they figure out what to do themselves. Right? Now that does mean, of course, that you know, the things that they can't figure out tend to be fairly difficult problems. Right? <laughs> And, and actually, he did that too. So you know, he talks about it in the book. You know, just sometimes waiting before making decisions, right? Just to let other people sort them out. Right? Although waiting in this day and age is probably uh, much shorter times than than that. Oh yeah, yeah, it's of course, so because speeded up. because the, you know the, the communication system was the telegraph, of course, and by letter, right? right. People so. think if they heard haven't heard back in three minutes, you haven't responded. Well, exactly. I mean, this day, it, in this day of email, they send you an email and they expect a response immediately, right? Well, they're not going to get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you um, answer email through the night, as some people around here do? No, I try to sleep through the night. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> sounds like a good thing to do. Yeah. What does the dean for undergraduate education at MIT do? What do you do? What is the job? Well, I, I would say uh, there's the several different things, right? So, in in the sense of a in the, what people in management would call line, I have line responsibility for a number of offices. That is, they report to me. I set their budgets. I hire. I'm. I. Uh, they, they're, they're, the leaders are all direct reports to me. I'm the one who chooses them. You know, when they leave, and I do their performance evaluations. So, so that, that's that's the admissions office. The financial aid office, careers office, uh, the registrar's office, uh, you know, and so on. So there's actually ten of these offices across MIT that, you know, and so I, I'm the line person to who who's responsible for for them, you know. Now, but so that's that's part of the job. But I I'm also I would say responsible in a, in a more strategic sense for helping, you know, working with the provost. Uh, and the chance of helping set the directions for how one thinks about, you know, education, you know, at, at MIT. So, uh, I, I spend a lot of my time trying to, you know, be more strategic in that, and advising those individuals about, you know, what are the things that we should be doing or not doing, and, you know, and, and you know, and so on. So, I, uh, there's both a kind of a strategy role, uh, and, and then, then there's also this this line role of managing all these people. Right? Um, and you know, and then you know, there's some specific things that are in there. So, part of the job is to recommend to the president what the new tuition should be every year, you know, which I do, and you know, how much financial aid Zero? we should. <laughs> no, <laughs> how much financial aid we sh we should we should uh, uh, you know deal with. You know, I, you know I, part of the job is giving out curriculum development funds to to the faculty, and you know, and so on. So, so there's a range of th those things there. But I would say the two different aspects of it is this line responsibility and then the strategic responsibility for education. So you were moved into this job really from your engineering posts. How do you begin to get your own bearings and, and think about strategy in, a, in an area where 
you had participated in some of those fields, but admissions, financial aid, I mean, those must have all been pretty new to you. Right, right, right. So as, as I've told several of the people there, you know, I, I, I used to walk up and down the infinite corridor, which is where most of those offices actually are. And I literally had no idea what went on behind those doors, right? So, uh, you know, now, so, so it's an interesting question, right, how, how to get my bearings. At, at the level of, you know, strategy more generally, right, which is, you know, part of the job, you know, I, part of what I was doing in the engineering systems division and leading that was, was helping set the strategy for how the division should actually operate. So at the level of, of doing strategic thinking, I, I mean, I know how to do that. I, I know how to help people move along. And, but of course, the focus there was on a particular kind of engineering. I suppose you might call it holistic engineering. And here the focus is on the strategy, really more of education. Uh, and then, as you say, w you know, what these specific offices are actually doing. So, so the, the answer is, I had to be a quick study, right? I mean, you know, get in there, talk to the people. They're the experts. Tell me what you do. I mean, let, let's, you know, set the tone and direction, which is what the leader, leader does. I mean, I, I don't in detail tell these people who run these offices what to do because they're the experts, right? Uh, but I, I set the overall tone and the direction for the offices, right? And, and, you know, we have lots of conversations. Lots of things I don't know, and they, they let me know when I don't know things. I encourage <laughs> them to tell me, you know. Right. What prompted you to accept the job? Did you even think twice about, hmm, is this moving out of engineering and, and science, and do I really want to take that step? Well, it's manifestly moving out of engineering, right? So, I mean, I still have faculty appointments in the, in the School of Engineering, but that's not where most of my time actually goes right now. So. But do you think of it as... Kind of a, a temporary detour, or do you think of it as I may well not go back to to real science or engineering mm -hmm. research? Well, well, you know, at MIT, you know, as, as you know, has a long history of people coming from the faculty to serve the administration and actually returning to the faculty. Right. So, so you know, if if let me call it the the resistance to doing that was zero, then that would be that's exactly how I would think about it. Uh, now, of course, the reality is. You go do one of these administration jobs, and and you know you, there's only so much time in a day. And what happens is you know your your ability to engage in teaching and research goes down very substantially. So so the resistance to returning is not zero. It means you have to work hard at actually picking it back up again and doing what regular faculty actually actually do. But uh, but you know I guess my thinking was actually coming from the faculty and then ultimately at some point. You know, returning to the faculty, right? Are you still doing any science and engineering research now? Well, I, I have a small research group that that has continued over the years. It is actually smaller now than when I when I started because there were a number of proposals that I had I had won and that had you know we continued to execute on. But as those students graduated, I didn't have the time to replace them, so uh, it's down to two students actually right now. But graduate students? Yeah, two PhD students, right? I like working with PhD students because and don't you, have you don't have to tell to them what to do. And you read in the field, or, or, or is that pile? Well, but but I, but, you know, you work with the students, right? I mean, the students are doing a lot of the, the broad-based, the broadband reading, and you know, I, the conversations with them help inform me, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the interaction with the students that actually helps me stay as, you know, relatively current. But having said that, I'm not going to deny that it's hard to do because you know the amount of reading I have to do in terms of both the scholarly work as well as, of course, the stuff I have to read as part of the dean's job is, is so large that, you know, I'm just continuously going at it. Right. But, but, but then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, I'm also trying to read some other things because I, I have to be uh, genuinely knowledgeable about what's going on in the whole business of, of higher education as part, right. of this, uh, part of this job. So, Are you doing any teaching at this point? Well, I, I'm teaching a freshman seminar, right, because because I thought it was a good idea to do that. You know, since I'm, I'm the Dean for Undergraduate Education, I, I need to have an independent way to access undergraduate students. I mean, not filtered through all the other people who filter it to me, but directly, right? So, so by teaching a freshman seminar, I get eight freshmen in every year, and we, I directly talk to them about how life is going for them at MIT, right? And, and so what they're, they're, is the seminar focused on? Well, it's called the Engineer of 2020. 
Uh, so I, 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 over the years, I've been fairly heavily involved in some national panels on how to think about the future of engineering, which is probably why I was asked to be head of the Engineering Systems Division. And, and um, so I, I'm cognizant of what's been on the, na in the national press and the panels. I actually served on several of them. So I, I, I put together a whole set of the readings associated with that, and we, in a structured, uh, over, you know, 14 or so weeks, we go through all of them. We discuss them, and we ask the question, what will the engineers of 2020 actually look like, which is now, of course, only 10 years from now, and what, what are the things you, that is the students, should be doing now to prepare yourself for that future? Right? Uh, and and the, the, the first order quick answer is, it's, more than, it's way, way more than just technical stuff you need to know. You need to know about lots of what people call the softer skills, right? Such as communications, uh, uh, negotiation, uh, broad-based contextual understanding of the role of engineering in the world, uh, socio-technical issues, the impact of people upon engineering. You need to know a lot of that kind of stuff. So, so we go through all of that in a, in a discussion format. Right? And as you think about that so explicitly, and then you look at the MIT undergraduate education, how does it measure up? What do we do well, and what don't we do well, so well? That's a very ins insightful question. So, it, there's some things we do exceptionally well, right? And you know, one of my part of my job is I, you know, I have to look at a lot of the data. So I see a lot of the data we collect on this. So it's extremely clear that we we do exceptionally well at, at developing uh, quantitative analytical skills in students. I mean, much better than our peers, probably probably because of the way we 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 press the students. So, it's also clear we, we do very well in helping our students develop how to think under time pressure uh, and you know to to think critically under time pressure. So we, we do that very well. Uh, it, now some things we don't do so well, we actually don't do so well on communications. You know, the, the ability of our students to communicate, n not, not to themselves, but to people who are not themselves, people who don't come with the same mental framework, you know, is, I'm not going to say it's terrible, because I don't believe it's terrible, but it's not as good as it could be. And, and you know, in, in, a, in this day and age, an engineer, uh, well, I would say anybody, needs to be able to communicate what they're doing to people who are not themselves, you know, because the world is full of people who are not themselves, you know. Right. So, so we, we, have, we have some challenges there, and we also have challenges in terms of our students being able to put what they're doing in a broader social context, actually. Which so is part of what the engineering systems division yes. is about, actually. Yes, it is. It is part of what it was about, right. So, you know, th and that, that's what the Engineer 2020 studies actually very clearly show, and that those are areas that we need to, uh, here at MIT, actually substantially improve on. Right? Do you think the students who come through your seminar and think about what they need to have so directly, as opposed to just assuming, um, handle the rest of their education any differently from their classmates? In other words, there are communications requirements mm. yes. for all students, yeah. but do these students then understand why they're there yeah. more in a more powerful way and yeah. therefore take yeah. them more seriously? Or? So I, I have had the students tell me after they've gone through you know, the, the discussions and the readings, and by, by, by having them read the national you know, studies, the national data, they, they appreciate it. it's not just me saying this, right? There are lots of people in the country saying this, right? I have had the students tell me that they, f first of all, they appreciate more, as you said, why we have things like a communication requirement, but also that they appreciate more the, the broader context in which they're, they're, they're thinking about their science and technology is, is actually done. And, you know, and in that sense, it's been, been good for them. Right, and maybe it encourages them to take some more courses in the humanities requirements. I, I don't know. But Have you thought about how MIT could do better on this front? I mean, I think people have been grappling with it for a while. The communications, in particular, there there have been different uh, iterations of communications requirements. Yeah, but uh. I don't think people think that they've reached an answer yet. Do you have any thoughts beyond about what might be done further or differently? Yeah, so I, I, you know, if I had a magic wand to wave here, I would actually decompress the schedule here. 
one of the things our, our, our students actually say, both they say to us, and we see it clearly in the survey data, is that they don't have very much time to reflect. So, so you know, reflection is not a skill that's well learned here at MIT because the time pressures are so intense, right? So, you know, I, I would actually decompress. That is, and if we insist on four years, the only way to do that, you understand, is to reduce the amount of stuff that we actually require uh, um, in the in the engineering and science departments, and then actually, uh, you know, give greater freedom for students to make some, uh, you know, elective choices within that. I mean, that's what I would do if I were. For That's interesting because the humanities requirements have gone a little in the other direction after the latest uh, mm. changes were adopted by the faculty to be more restrictive in what freshmen, I think, and maybe upperclassmen can take in the way of humanities. Well, no, I, I, I would say more coherent. Right. I mean, they, they had got to the point where they were offering for an individual from incoming freshmen, you know, 72 different alternatives. Uh, the freshmen don't know what to do with 72 different alternatives. I mean, I'm not sure I know what to do with 72 different alternatives. So, so the, no, that, that change was to make it more mm -hmm. focused and, and coherent and provide a bigger, yeah. uh, you know, bigger classes for students so that they could all collectively focus on, you know, sort of big problems to actually address. So, so I think the focus there was somewhat different then. I'm uh, interested, so. though, in, in your communications point. A lot of skills students pick up math, computation, science techniques are taught by full professors, mm. tenure track. Mm. The communications, there's a writing requirement, yeah. and there's a whole staff of non-tenure track instructors. That's right. And I wonder if that sends a message to students that even though we require it, it's somehow less important, and therefore uh. communication is important, but yeah. maybe less important. Does that uh, I've never had make a student, sense? I've never had a student explicitly say that to me. Right uh, now, c could it could it send a message? I mean, unfortunately, that's that's the what has become the culture in the yeah. you know humanistic disciplines, right? Uh, that a lot of the things that are seen as the kind of the grunt work are taught by instructors and by adjuncts and so on, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, I suppose the students could deduce that, but I, I've, I've never had a student explicitly say that, right, to me. Coming back to the, the Lincoln book, um, it says that one tool he employed was to look at things firsthand. Yes. And that he visited battle scenes and talked yes. to troops. I think it's a skill that, that these days sometimes gets called management by walking around. Yeah. Is that something you apply, and are you able to get out of your office much? and? visit with students or faculty or even observe classes? Yeah. So I said, th that's exactly why I, I had to, have, I wanted to have a freshman seminar myself, so I could get direct access to, if you want, the front lines. You know, you're right, Lincoln actually did that. Uh, he would go visit the troops. There was one famous time, of course, where he almost came under fire, and maybe he did actually come under fire, you know, from, from the other side, because it was just, it was important to him to hear things, not just from his generals, uh, 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 you know, the nature of the higher uh, military organizations, of course, is that they will tend to filter up good news. <laughs> and he wanted to hear what was actually going on. And so in the same way, you're right, I, I, I need to hear directly from the students. I have, you know, I spend a fair amount of my time having, you know, mainly meals with, with students, again, just to get a sense of, of actually, uh, you know, what's going on there. Um, in the residence hall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they invite me. Go to, go to fraternities, go to, go to have dinner with them in the residence hall. So that's always interesting. And they really sit and talk. Yeah. What kinds of things? Well, come they, out? What they probably they probably talk because <laughs> of, because I'm there, right? <laughs> oh sure. Well, uh, well. So one of the things I always ask them is, you know, where where else did they apply? And, you know. Given that obviously they're, they're here at MIT, right? I mean, are, are they glad they were here, and and what are the things that they're actually you know learning, right, here at MIT? So I I always ask them that. That's that's always very interesting, you know, to get a sense of. Then then you know how it, how's it going? I mean, and are, are they participating in the various opportunities that we actually provide, you know, for students? So I, I find those conversations actually interesting. Can you think of any 
policies that have resulted or changes or a feeling of, gee, I really didn't realize this before talking to them that, that have come out of these conversations over the years? Well, I'll give you one very specific one. I, I went and visited our students at Cambridge University. We, In we England? Have, yeah. We have a whole bunch of students here in our Cambridge MIT exchange, right? This was a few years ago. And, and the entire time they spent talking to me about, you know, the, the, the difficulties with the cost of living there. And, and so, you know, after I came back from that, uh, and I, I, went, I went with the director of financial aid, and we actually came up with some more money to actually help them. Uh, that was, you know, I heard back from them was, you know, made a substantial, you know, difference to what they're actually doing. So that was a very specific uh, mm -hmm. return on those kind of conversations, right? Another chapter in, in the Lincoln book looked at how he handled criticism. I, yeah, you were yeah. talking a little about that before yeah. and sometimes ignoring it and sometimes challenging it. You end up dealing with a lot of delicate issues here, I guess, ranging from tuition increases yeah. and, and uh, yeah. other unpleasant topics. What are the biggest hot button issues that, that you've faced in the past years and what are the, what's on the table now? Yeah, right. So, so first, the first thing I do, of course, is, is do just what, what Lincoln did, right? Which is, uh, there are things that people can address to me that I actually don't need to deal with. So I, I have, you know, the people who work for me actually deal with them, right? Uh, and so, you know, the things that do, I do end up dealing with tend to be the more, more difficult problems, actually, which is, which is just what Lincoln did. Um, now, so what are some of the, the issues that have actually uh, faced you know, I've had parents call me very upset about various things. I mean, you know, often when the, when parents, you know, approach me very specifically, it's about something that their son or daughter, it's a very specific situation with regard to the, to the, you know, son or daughter. And, you know, and if I can help within the context of our policies, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can actually do, right? Now, uh, actually, and, and issues like, like, um, tuition and financial aid, the, the, the criticism tends to be fairly, you know, generalized. It's not directed at me specifically, probably because they don't know what exactly my I wondered is. if it got personalized. No, no, no but, but I, we have faced criticism over, you know, why is it we're increasing our tuition at a rate greater than, you know, uh, the CPI. Uh, you know, and, and to which we try to point out that, you know, our net tuition actually over the last several years has gone down because we've been increasing our financial aid actually much faster than 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 the CPI. So, um, so I mean that issue has come up. You know, we the, there has been various uh, let's call it angst <laughs> from the students about some of the new pedagogies that we we tried, particularly the what's called TEAL, the uh, Technology Enabled Active Learning. I've had students complain to me about that. In the that. physics area. Yeah, <laughs> I've had students complain to me about that. I. I go through the data with them about how we believe it's a more effective way, you know, for for teaching and so on, right? You know, and there, there's been f mainly actually from students and some also discussion around the state of advising at MIT, and that's an ongoing, you know, debate that I keep having with the students, right? So, you know, I, I th this is a very very data driven environment, at least at the level of the students, right? So I I've just found if I can present them with with the data and have serious discussions that, you know, those students are willing to have serious discussions. Right? How important is the advising function and, and good advice from professors rather than from classmates? Or? Well, you know, th this is the difference, of course, between reality and, and you know, what we say. So what we say is that we, exp we, we would like the students to get their advice from, you know, people who are presumably knowledgeable, like Let's let's start with the faculty, right? This is this is academic and mentoring kind of advice, right? That that's what we'd like. Now, but what our survey data shows us is the first the f because we we actually in the senior survey ask them where they got their advice from. Uh, most commonplace is um, from their friends. After that, it's from their parents, <laughs> you know, right? And like number five is from their academic advisor, you know. <laughs> I mean, we have a whole bunch of other people are in there, you know. So, I mean, so this is reality, right? Uh, as opposed to what you know, what we what we think. But we would say, and I actually do believe that 
that helping a student get positive mentoring uh, advice, so both mentoring and, and specific academic advice, is, is important to their development here. And, and furthermore, what, what we know is that, that s certainly if, if you think that one measure of success is, is going on to graduate school, I'm not saying that's the only measure, but certainly if you think that's one measure. We know there's a high correlation between students choosing to go to graduate school and getting good and appropriate mentoring advice from faculty. And it's the students who have good, strong connections with the faculty are much more likely to make that choice than students who do not. I mean, that, the survey data clearly shows us that. Right? Do you have any measures of when and how students who think they got better advice got it? In other words, does it come th through Europe or through the freshman seminar program or something else? In other words, mm. even well, if it's number five, is there some way to tell what does work best? Yeah, so actually a good to, thing you mentioned Euro it? Europe. So th that what students tell us about Europe, you know, what's the value of Europe to them? Uh, getting to know a faculty member, presumably in part so that they can get some advice and recommendations from a faculty member. Uh, and they tell us it also is valuable to them in terms of helping them to understand how to deal with ambiguity, because that's the nature of research. Uh, and then also, uh, t uh, another interesting one is tell it, t telling them what they don't want to do, because it helps them to think about you know, I mean, once you do a Europe in some area and discover, I don't like that area, well, okay, now you've learned something, right? And so you move on, right? So, so Europe, in that sense, is, is actually good for the interactions. It, that is, the interactions with faculty are, are one of the mechanisms, right? Do they recognize that? Is there a, a semantic issue? So many students have Europe experiences. Yeah. That's something like 85% right. plus, right. or, and yet here you come back to students saying, advising, you know, faculty was fifth yeah. in, ter in your list of yeah, where yeah. they got their yeah. advice from. There seems to be a disconnect, or do they say, oh, well, I only had one Europe advisor and I only saw well, them? Well, well so th this is why I, I deliberately used both advising and mentoring. Because, you know, oftentimes the students expect that what they will, they will get from interactions with, with you know, faculty is say, take this course and don't take that course and, and so on. And, and the reality is most of the faculty are not that knowledgeable mm -hmm. uh, about courses outside of their own courses, right? right? right. Uh, but so, you know, in, in so far as the students look for that, they get disappointed, right? They say, well, you know, this person didn't tell me I should take this course and not yeah. take that course, you know? And, and so they get, they're getting that information from their classmates, or from upperclassmen, to first right. Start, right? right. Whereas what the faculty are helpful is saying to them, you know, somebody doing as well as you should think about graduate school, or, you know, you know, given your set of skills, you should think about, you know, shifting areas to, you know, focus in a different direction or something else. I mean, that's the kind of thing that, that they will not get from their classmates, right? So, but, but, that, but most of the students aren't sophisticated enough to understand that, that, kind of, that level of difference, right? Let's back up and talk about your own path as mm -hmm. a student and what led you to MIT. Um, starting with where were you born and where did you grow up and what were you like as a child? So I, I, I was born in a place called Chardstock in Devon in England. I, I, my father was a dentist working there. Uh, and then, uh, so I, I grew up you know, in England, not, not in Devon, we actually moved north just to a place called Widnes, which is just outside of Liverpool. It was actually seven miles from where the Beatles actually were at that time doing their thing, right? <laughs> uh, and then, and then uh, my, my parents moved to, uh, to Jamaica when I was 10, so I, I moved with them. And then when I was 15, I returned to England to go to boarding school. So, uh, and then from then went on to you know, college, right? Now, so what, what, what kid was I? I was, you know, one of these, th this was the 60s, right? So I was one of these, kids very interested in the space program, the Apollo kind of years, uh, very motivated by, I watched every single Star Trek episode, 
at that time. That, that was, of course, that was Star Trek, the original Star Trek, right? which only lasted three seasons, right? <laughs> uh, but, but nevertheless, I, I really enjoyed all those things. So that, that kind of motivated me. So, I, I, and, I, and I found when I was in school, uh, which of course was in the English system between, between England and, and Jamaica, which was also the English system, you know, I was very good at science and mathematics, you know, particularly. So, and, and much less good at, you know, languages and I was actually reasonable at history, but languages I wasn't that facile with, right? So I struggled with languages, and I didn't struggle at all with science and, and mathematics. So, you know, it, it, when, when time came to, to go to college, it just seemed to me to, you know, I, I'm actually a firm believer in going with things you're, you're strong at. It makes most more sense to do things that you enjoy than things you don't enjoy, you know? <laughs> so I wasn't going to choose to go into kind of more the humanistic um, Disciplines. Although I actually enjoy history a lot, right? So I ch I chose to go more into uh, well I, I I chose to go into into science or mathematics, and I had the choice of going to physics or uh, mathematics or even engineering actually. But because uh, when I was admitted to Oxford, they gave me a choice, and so I, I chose to go to mathematics. Right? So I did mathematics uh, at Oxford, and when I when I finished. Uh, uh, being a young man then, I wasn't entirely sure what to do with myself, so I thought, why not go to graduate school? <laughs> so I came to graduate school, you know, here at, at MIT, and and given that I was a kind of a child of the the, the space program, right? I mean, I came here to to the aero and astro department to do, you know, to work on space things, right? Now th this was 1976, and I, I remember actually showing up here. And, uh, and being uh, talking to various people, and I say, I want to work on space things. And they said, well, six years too late. <laughs> because, the, you know, basically after, you know, Apollo landed on the moon in 1969, right? I mean, things kind of started phasing down. Uh, and the last mission was 75, as I recall. It's Apollo-Soyuz mission, right? Uh, so, and the last mission to the moon, of course, was actually canceled, right? So what was your reaction then? Boy, I got to do something else. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but you know what was phasing up at that time was energy. So, uh, I, I, I mean, it was I mean, this was when the President Carter had just come in, a lot of emphasis on alternative energy things, and so I, I actually uh, ended up starting to do research in in energy related work. So I worked in the. I, I learned as a discipline plans of physics, and I. I worked uh, in looking at magnetohydrodynamic energy generation and then looking at fusion energy generation. And this all fit in Aero and Astro? It sounds like you should have been in uh, well, physics well, and... Well, and well, actually, no, it didn't quite fit in Aero Astro, but, but the MIT was sufficiently broad that I could actually do those things still while having a, a you know, home as a department within Aero and Astro, actually, which, is, which tells you a lot about the flexibility of the MIT. Uh, system. Right? But it's interesting that you were looking at space systems and applied to this department and were taken in and then had this conversation about, well, here's my interest. Yes. That doesn't make sense. Yes. It, it didn't happen before. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, so I, 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 that I can't speak to. I mean, why did they admit me given that? Because yeah. I clearly said I wanted to actually do that. But, you know, uh, I mean, I maybe it's because I just thought I was a good person, right? <laughs> to have around, right? Yeah. So did did the department have a question of redirection at that point? In other words, had they been focused on yes. the same things you were interested in and they needed to Yes. Well, because you know, the way at the graduate level in engineering things work is you know, th there are a few fellowships available, but by and large what happens of course is it's individual faculty and their research interests and so you know, the real, and as they can get research money in, I mean, that's what supports the students, right? So, uh, so basically, after 1970, you know, the research money in, in, you know, going to the moon went away, and and the money in alternative energy actually went up. I mean, so that's why I was able to change because I was offered a, a research assistantship to actually work in these alternative energy sources, right? With a professor in that department. Yeah, yeah, in in yeah. the aero department. That's right. Oh. I mean, so that you know, because faculty are, are broadly available to do whatever they want, right? So there you were at Oxford in in England. How and why did you think about MIT, and did you apply to other universities too? So 
I, so something I didn't tell you along the way, I actually as a science and technology kind of person, right, uh, interested in that, I, I had wanted to apply to MIT as an undergraduate. I thought, you know, this is the best place in the world to learn about this kind of stuff. I, I enjoy it. I'm good at it. So why, why don't I go to MIT? But my, well, to my father looked at the sticker price, and he said, we can't afford this. <laughs> And then it was much less than it is now, right? But of course, one's income was much less. So, so he just said, we can't afford this. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, what he didn't appreciate and I didn't appreciate was financial aid, right? <laughs> if, if we'd known that, how much financial aid was available, even then, right, we might well have applied. I might well have come here. But he just said, no, not, he wouldn't let me apply because he, he couldn't afford to pay for it if I'd gotten in, thinking you'd have to pay the full tuition, right? And so I had to go somewhere else. Now, now I, I, I ended up going to Oxford. That was, this is not a bad choice, you understand, right? I mean, but the communications, the, the whole difference between sticker price and, and real price. Yes. Um, it was not clear then. was not clear. And and I think by the way, it's still not clear, right? We, that's we, the question. We yeah. still struggle with that, getting that across to, to you know, parents and to students, right? That, you know, because they see our sticker price now. I mean, in today's right. dollars like 38k or something, right? Do you think uh, there's anything more that MIT can or should do on that front? Well, you know, we try to every way we can get out the message that, that we we have a lot of financial aid that we want mm -hmm. people to come here, right. though, and we will enable it. You know, if they can't pay, it is still the case, of course, that we expect. You know the primary responsibility lies with the parents and the students, but if they can't afford it, then we will enable it. So, so you know, and and of course, once we get people to apply, and and admit them, you know, we can actually talk them through that. It's it's getting people into the pool. You know, it's the people who don't even apply because mm -hmm. they they, you know, like Dan Hastings. Like me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Never apply. But 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 to be clear, I I have no regrets about my my path, because I went to Oxford, I got a first-rate education. I mean, a very different education at, at, at MIT, right? But there's no question in mind it was first-rate education, right? Different in what way? Well, I mean, the, you know, the Oxford and, Oxford and Cambridge system, so the Oxford system, right? It's based around essentially almost personalized tutorial interactions, you know, with students, you know, which is very different from, from the MIT system. So. You know, I, I read mathematics, but I had two tutors, and you know, we worked over several years through helping my understanding of mathematics. And it was it was clear to me when I went in, at least in retrospect, it was clear that you know, I my ability to think critically was well okay, but not great. And by the time I came out, it was substantially better. And I'd also learned some mathematics as well. And th this came about because of this, you know, twice weekly interaction, intense interaction with tutors who basically sat and questioned me and said, have you thought about this? Read this and let's discuss it. And, you know, when you're discussing something in, at a level of detail with a very intelligent person who is responding directly to you, you know, it very quickly it sharpens your thinking, you know. All right. So, and that, that's the Oxford system, which is actually a great system for the students who go through it, right. And then, of course, you build all kinds of networks at Oxford, and it's a very interesting environment. So, how do you think your preparation coming out of your boarding school in England was compared to um, some kind of average American high school graduate? And then, how do you think your mm. uh, readiness or preparation at the end of your Oxford years was compared to, say, a, a student graduating from MIT? Or the so, inputs and the outputs. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, compared to a, a high school graduate, so um, that's an interesting question. I've never thought about that one. My preparation. So you know, in 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 the English system, you have to make choices much earlier than in the American system as about you know what you actually do. So on, on the things that I did, which was you know I even as in high school, mathematics and physics and so on, coming out of high school, I probably knew more than the average American undergraduate. But on the other hand, my education wasn't so broad, right? Because all I'd done since I was 13, that's when I had to make the choice. Wow. All I'd done since I was 13, from 13 to 17-ish, so it was, you know, mathematics and physics and chemistry, right? So, you know, I mean, the, the broader base education that American high school kid gets, I, I never got. 
right? And I, I've had to, in some ways, make it up with my own reading, right? Uh, I mean, I never got biology in any serious sense, and I've never actually made that one up. But but some of the the history I never got, I have actually, you know, made up in a more substantial kind of way, right? So, so you know, it's, 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 it's good and bad, right? Now, and then, you know, relative to, you know, you say coming out at the end of MIT, I, uh, again, you know, the, in the Oxbridge system, well, I mean, I, I, I studied mathematics. That's all I did. I, that's all I did. I mean, here at MIT, you know, even for the people who study mathematics here, right? Half of what they do is the General Institute requirements, and they have to do eight humanities, arts, and social sciences classes, right? And they have free electives, and so on, and so on, and communication requirements, and so on. There was none of this nonsense at Oxford, right? It was just so. If you were just, that specialized, just just specialized given stuff. the trade-offs, does that suggest that you covered a lot more ground in science and math because you were doing nothing but yes. that? Yeah. No, no. I, it was very apparent to me when I arrived here, right? At least in mathematics, okay, I knew as much as a first year, a, a graduate student here at the end of the first year. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, in, in many other areas, I, I, I knew much less, right? So it, in that sense, it's just a question of time, right? right. I, I actually think, frankly, the, the system here is better. Right? Is there anything about your Oxford experience or even your boarding school experience that that you thought was better that has influenced decisions or thinking about uh, undergraduate education here as you go about helping make policy? Well, th this is where it comes back to time to reflect. I, I definitely had much more time to reflect in my, in my Oxford experience than the students have here. Right? And so, so that's why I continually emphasize it to, to students, right? And, 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 and th again, this is not me just making this up. I mean, first of all, I believe it's actually true, right? I had more time than the average student gets here. Secondly, we, n we know from our data, our survey data from students, we, our students that we send to Cambridge and then come back after a year, they say the same thing, mm -hmm. that they found suddenly they had more time to think and to reflect, right? But, but there's actually something else we know. Right, people, people who study what they call deep learning, I mean, how is it you learn something deeply as opposed to in a shallow way, will tell you time to reflect is, is critical to deep learning. So, so in that sense, it, it's, a, it's a really good thing to actually have. You know. Does it take a special skill or discipline to use that time well? Oh, you do have to be disciplined. You don't, you don't have to waste it. I mean, you have to, it, what you have to do is go back over the knowledge you're learning in several different ways. Um, be, be again, because what I th modern learning theory would tell us is if the more ways that you can actually try to process what you actually learn, the, the better off you'll actually learn it, because you're just looking at it from different perspectives, right? So, you know, reflecting and then attacking it again from several different perspectives is just a very important thing to do. Going back to your childhood, you, you talked about loving rocketry and, and mm -hmm. s the space programs. Mm -hmm. Were you a tinkerer? Did you Build rockets yourself. I uh, tried as a child. I tried not, not just rockets, but various kinds of you know physical devices. Some of them, sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't. You know, built a lot of model aircraft. I like to do that. Although you ended up doing engineering that was more theoretical than yeah, yeah. Oh, well, beca because what I found out as as I as I did that is that in in building things with with my hands, I I was I was okay, but I. But I wasn't that skillful at it. Whereas you, the, the more things were kind of theoretical, uh, you know, more mathematically oriented, I, I was actually much better at that. Right. So it was a you know it was a case of go, going with my my strengths, I guess. Right? right. Did you apply to other graduate programs besides MIT, or were you simply confident that you would be admitted? Actually, I did. I applied to Brown, as I recall, and uh, University of. Illinois, as I recall. Oh, and Princeton, yeah. But all American. Yeah, yeah, no, all, all American, because I decided, you know, after finishing at Oxford, I wanted to come to America, I guess, seek my fortune in America. Right. How much culture shock was there coming from England to the U.S.? Actually, there, w there was some culture shock, 
Uh, now, not, not as much culture shock as, say, going, say, to Texas or, to, you know, <laughs> or California. Uh, no, there was, there was some culture shock. I mean, one of the things I, I noticed immediately was, was how much more expansive was people's sense of, of, of distance here, right? You, you realize you live in England, and there's a, uh, as I did, and before that I lived in Jamaica, right? Jamaica is an island of, uh, uh, of uh, 144 miles long, 22 miles wide. In England, there's no place you're not more than 75 miles from the sea. You know? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long island, but you can head off and, and you'll hit the sea if you head off, you know, in the right direction there. So, it's not that, the point is, it's not that big a place, right? And, and one of the things I, I observed very quickly in talking to people here is their sense of, of distance was so much larger. And I, and I appreciated that once you started to, so I started to drive, you know, in this country, right? I mean, you, you can get in a car and drive for a whole day and you, you, you just about reach you know, some part of New York State, you know, right? Right? And, you know, you won't, you won't be to the sea. Well, you'll be to the sea if you drive towards Boston. You won't be to the sea for many, many days, right? And that, that sense of just distance, uh, that, that was one thing. And, and, and the other thing I, I appreciated, I got to see pretty quickly, was, was the sense of, you know, th this at that time was, and, and still is, a, a young country you know, certainly relative to living in England, right? So in England, there's, there's so much that's kind of bound up by it's being an old country. And, and f in, in terms of the social culture at that time, you know, fairly, fairly hierarchical. Um, and and it, believe me, going to Oxford, I saw that in spades, you know, because Oxford and Cambridge are the places, the elite universities in England have produced most of the political uh, and upper class and the, you know, and so I, I, I ran into a lot of those kind of people, you know, and, uh, you know, so there's, there's, a, there's a very strong sense of a class culture, at least I found at that time in Oxford, and, and, and coming here, there was just so much less of it. It was actually, it was actually very uh, enlightening and, and it was a relief to me, you know. Now, yeah, and, and the way I tell people now is, uh, you know, in England it was kind of who was who your father and you know, what's your family line? And here it was, what have you done for me lately? <laughs> right. I, I came across that attitude pretty, pretty quickly. You know? Do you think it affected people's approach to science and engineering in any way? Yeah, because this is a very, I mean, especially a place like MIT is a very kind of merit-driven place and, you know, people actually performing. So the answer is, yeah, it does. You probably had had even the fact that you had moved from England to Jamaica as as a child probably gave you lessons in adaptability. Mm. So that when you moved again, you'd already done this. Yeah, well, sure. In that sense, moving countries was not. I'm not going to say it was trivial, but it wasn't such a big deal. You know, so Do you? get involved in helping students who have adjustment problems here, be they under, well, your undergraduate education. Uh, mm -hmm. Do many of them come here and face culture shock, either in terms of workload or in terms of even the uh, um, partying or personal extracurricular activities? You mean students who come to MIT? Right. <laughs> well, actually, the answer is yes, they do. Um, uh, you know, we, uh, MIT attracts a, a particular kind of students, right? And so, uh, w uh, very often those, those students are perceived of as more, I suppose, in high school here, more nerdy, I suppose is the term, right? <laughs> and, and then, you know, and, and the very, what, what often is the case is they, they, are, they are part of a much smaller group in their high school and feel more kind of isolated. So they come here to MIT and they, f they find they're suddenly with people like themselves. As a matter of fact, we, we've heard this quite a bit when we, when we talk to freshmen. Freshmen say, suddenly I'm with, there are people like me here, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> and, and they're with people, you know, who, all of whom were kind of seen as nerdy and isolated in high school and now they're all kind of put into one place together. And not, not only that, but they, but they're they're individuals who, you know, to to say smart things is not seen here as unusual or 
bad. Or whereas in high school, they were kind of suppressed it because you know, they knew if they said something smart that they would, somebody else would you know, look down on them or something, right? So, so you know, and that's what I, I, and then of course they come here and they get involved in the culture here. So actually, those are actually significant adjustment problems for the for the students. Uh, one of the things we have to tell them is, you know, the, the way to think about this place is is like a candy store, right? So lots of goodies. And what 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 happens if you remember what happened as a kid? If you went to a candy store, you just started grabbing each goodie, after, and you, you you know you ate it. After a while, you get sick, right? I, I remember seeing that with my kids. Actually, <laughs> yeah. So so we tell students when they come here. So you know suddenly. You like you with people like yourself. You're in this candy store full of goodies. You have got to learn some discipline in this place because otherwise you will overload. Right. And that's something you talk about in your freshman seminar too. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm I'm very careful with them. I tell them, you know, I I want to know not just what courses they're taking because I mean actually I can get that from the transcripts, right? Uh, I want to know what else they're doing. Tell me about all their extracurricular activities, right? And you know, let's make sure that it stays in balance, right? I, I talk to them about the importance of forming networks, you know, uh, and how to learn and grow in this culture. So, yeah, I mean, it's a whole package that we actually have to look at. Do you ever think about whether what you're covering in your seminar ought to be would be useful to all the other freshmen too, rather than just eight of them, and whether there's some way to give some part of it? To the freshmen as part of a freshman orientation or uh, well, an optional yeah, yeah, over yeah. the semester, everybody can participate. Yeah. Well, I have uh, there is an OCW site based on it now. The students can go take a look at the right? open course. Yeah, fair. open course. Fair, right. Do you I know actually who uses it. Is it MIT well, students or people outside? It just went up, so I I, I don't know. I don't. So this will be the first time. Yeah, yeah. I don't have, I don't have the data on who's actually using it's it. It's an right? OCW. So. Your seminar will be available on no, the No, no, not, not with me talking to the students. The curriculum material is available, right? Which is what we do with any of our open course for, you know, courses, right? Uh, you know, some of the things I said, of course, in the orientation to freshmen, we will tell them, right? But, but the reality is, you know, what happens in orientation is they get overwhelmed, so we have to c just continually reinforce it, right? So, but that's an interesting question. I hadn't thought about that, right? You were talking about the students who come to MIT as being the nerds of their class and so forth. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that's less true now than in the past. You oversee admissions, mm -hmm. and uh, do we still admit the same types of students, or are they broader in some ways than they used to be? Well, I, the, the measures we have would indicate they're getting broader. Now, now it is it is still the case that uh, you know some large fraction of our students you know are at the very top of their high school classes, right? And they still have a t t probably to want to come to MIT a lot of propensity towards science and engineering would be my guess, right? Or you know, be more quantitative, right? So uh, th that all that's still true. Now, but what what is the case is that we we see like other elite higher education institutions, that, that students over the last 15 years have gotten broader in terms of the number of extracurriculars that they actually do, as well as the type of things that they're doing. And so we, we see a lot more service activities that they're doing in, in high school. Um, you know, so do good kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot more of that now. Um, so as well as just a lot more extracurriculars, you know, I mean, you know, the we see students applying with ten different things that they're actually doing. So in that in that sense, the I, I suppose the image of a very narrow individual who you know lives in their room and doesn't come out and I suppose a classic nerd, right, <laughs> and only focuses upon mathematics. That's less true than it was, right? But they still come in. Being a little different because they thought differently, their patterns of thought are different. Yeah. They're quantitative and logical. And yes. Yeah. Yeah, and we still get students saying, they come here and say, "Now I'm with people like myself, <laughs> <laughs> who right. talk my language." Who talk my language? That's right. That's right. I remember the feeling. Yeah. <laughs> right. Come 
back to your time as a student at MIT. What was your dissertation about? What, what did you choose to focus on, and how did you decide that? Well, yeah, I, I remember I was working in energy-related things. So I, I actually worked in my, for my PhD in fusion energy work. And, uh, and you know, like, like all PhDs, you have to choose a specific topic. I was guided by my advisor. And, you know, but a fairly narrow, very specific topic, right? So I, I ended up looking at a kind of, of fusion machine called a mirror machine, where the, the, the plasma is contained between two sets of two magnetic fields, where fundamentally you set them up so they act as two mirrors on the end of a tube, and the plasma bounces backwards and forwards between these two things, which to, to the particles of the plasma look like mirrors. That is, they will actually reflect off the magnetic fields, right? And I, I so th that's a particular kind of device at that time. It was called a tandem mirror device, right? And what I was doing was looking at some of the instabilities in the plasma uh, that you know, that basically allowed the plasma to escape through the magnetic field. So I looked at a particular class called called drift waves, and and then how is it that these drift waves would actually behave under conditions where the plasma got fairly dense and fairly fairly energetic. So. Uh, you know, a fairly narrow topic. That uh, you could do well and quickly? Well, quickly is, you know, a few years, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was, a, it was by, at that time, a lot of code writing to write a, the simulations and, you know, for the, uh, for the plasma, which, which I did, and then, we, you know, developed the theory and solved the equations, and so, so what came did out. Did you have right? people on your thesis committee from other departments, like nuclear engineering or physics? I did. Nuclear and electrical engineering, actually, and, and aeroastro. Yeah, yeah. That, that and was it fairly common to have a committee of people from professors from different departments, or was it hard to assemble a committee? No, not at all. No, no, people no. People no. were used to doing things. People were used to doing that. That still goes on a lot, you know. Basically, you assemble the committees to help the students, you know, guide them in across some range of things that they're actually doing. So. Do you no. think it would have been as easy at another university to cross departmental boundaries, or are they more proprietary, or, or not? When it comes, uh, to actually, it's it's no. I I think I think MIT does that, this pretty well. You know, as as I tell students, I mean, once you're in here, you know, in inside the system, you can go almost anywhere that you actually want. I mean, I was in the aero department, but you know, I could form a thesis committee which is in fusion plasma physics, which was not per se at that time a mainstream activity at the aero department. And fine faculty, most of them were outside the department just to help me. And you know, that, that was fine. Did you yeah. do other activities while you were a graduate student, or were you pretty focused on your academics? Oh, did I do other activities? Well, I had a life. <laughs> not all yeah. grad students have a life. <laughs> I had a life, you know, that was, it was not just what was going on here, you know. Uh, you didn't have to work 24-7 in the lab. Well, I, it would not have been a good idea for me Only to do 23, that. Only 23-6. Yeah. No, no, I, I actually tell students, I, I have learned this empirically, that they, they need to understand what is their optimum efficiency in terms of, of uh, work, and that is how many hours on average that they can actually sustain per day and work to that level because once you go past the optimum, your your effectiveness goes down right, in time. So, you know, I, I ask them, you know, what, what's the value of working, you know, 16 hours a day if you find that, you know, six of those hours, you're actually just making mistakes that you have to correct later. You might as well only work 10 hours a day and not make the mistakes, you know? So, so the answer, I had a life outside of MIT. I was, I was I was heavily involved in uh, Park Street Church, which is over at Park Street in Boston, and I you know I was I dated a few young ladies. And I eventually ended up getting married, right? So, all while these, you were a grad student, while I was a grad student, so all these good things were happening. Right? Did that affect whether or not you were going to go back to England or somewhere else? Yeah. Well, it certainly changed my options, <laughs> right? Uh, so when I came, my my nominal plan was to, you know, finish a PhD and then, you know, go back to England. Insofar as, you know, somebody at that age, I, I, I thought deeply about it, which, which I can't confess I had, right? But, you know, I ended up getting married to somebody uh, uh, 
a young lady who was an American citizen. And, uh, and that, that enabled me to then stay, you know, to get a permanent residence, a green card, and get permanent residence. And did you stay, you know, stay in the United States, which I did. Think much about, how did you think about what you were going to do next as opposed to the where? In other words, did you think about teaching at that point or think about that was the last thing you wanted to do then or what? Well, I, what, I, what I felt when I finished here is that I had been doing research. I was good at research, right? So I thought, well, let's, let's pursue a career in research, right? Now, I also felt, you know, the, the time here at MIT, MIT is a fairly, um, it's a very energetic environment, uh, very, uh, very driven, but, but fairly hard in some way. So I felt, I felt, you know, I wanted to get away from MIT, okay? I didn't want to be here anymore. So I, I didn't even go to my own graduation because I just wanted to be done with this place, <laughs> right? So, so I, I left. And I, I got a job working for a company up in, well, it's now in Andover. At that time, it was in Woburn, Massachusetts, uh, do it called Physical Sciences. And what they did was contract research. They were, you know, small amounts of research contracted typically for the federal government, various parts of the government. Mainly what I was doing was, well, actually, it was not a fusion of physics. It was, it was mainly applied physics, right? Because you learn enough physics, you know, you can figure out what to do, right? Um, and then I, I did that for about a year and a half, and then I and then I decided I want to focus more on fusion plasma physics, and I, we moved to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where I was at Oak Ridge National Lab doing research. So I was, you know, part of the research staff there, and actually, you know, producing papers and doing what, whatever it is researchers actually do. Right. Had you worked either with a company or with a national lab before you? graduated or were these both totally new experiences well, no they were new experiences no I had not actually worked worked with either one so so I actually working for for physical sciences was very instructive because I I had to learn how to write reports that were not just technical reports I, I remember you know but that communicated clearly to sponsors you know, who didn't know kind of the details of what I was doing, right? So I remember very clearly the first uh, critique of my writing, right? Uh, From I, one of the people above you, uh, right? a manager. I was taken apart, <laughs> as I should have been, because it was just this dense stuff, you know? It was like I was writing a thesis again. So I, it was very helpful to me. How Although many it wasn't iterations did it take <laughs> to get it right? <laughs> Quite a few. I mean, it, I didn't, it wasn't pleasant, <laughs> no. but these things. But you learned a lot. But I learned a lot, you know, from having my, my writing critiqued and, and made much more focused. So, so the point is, sometimes people tell me I'm a fairly good writer now, but this didn't happen by, you know, just immediately out of the box. It happened by a lot of practice and, and iteration and being critiqued about it, you know. So. And at that point, it was a lot of cut and paste on on physical paper with typewriters, or uh, well, actually, uh, so this this was 1980. Uh, so, it, uh, I actually did my thesis was actually done using uh, a word processing system called LaTeX. Really? Yeah, uh, the, you know, which was in 1980, uh, and I here at MIT I was able to use the second laser printer ever built was here and were able to actually print it out on that and actually typeset it directly using using LaTeX, right? And so, so you know, and, and the, the editors were, were fairly crude relative to, to today's standards, but nevertheless, you know, it, you know, this was all actually done electronically, but, with, but by today's standards, you know, crude, <laughs> right? What was your stay at the National Lab like? Uh, how did you find it as a place to work and think and well actually live. as a place to work and think it was it was great because you know you with you with researchers at your level and above who are spending you know every day you're researching on you know in this case fusion energy and having detailed uh, intellectual I interactions with them so I, I enjoyed that so that, that was good I, I learned a lot of some very very smart people there and we had lots of good interactions, so. But at some point you left. What, what prompted well, that? 
Well, because because I, I after being there for um, oh, what was that three and a half years or so, uh, and and doing some very uh, abstruse mathematics. Um, I mean, I thought well done, but nevertheless abstruse, right? The the I, I I read one day I was sitting sitting at my desk and realizing there I was working away some very complicated triple integrals that I was actually doing. So I think well this is interesting, but 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 I realized I was missing something. What what I was missing was was interacting actually with students. I mean you know with with younger people. I mean, I, it was clear I was able to interact with peers there because there were lots of those people around. But, but with younger people and, and interacting more in kind of a kind of a teaching mode, helping them to actually understand, right? So, so I thought, well, you know, do, do I want to continue doing this, being a researcher like this, doing this abstruse mathematics, you know, for the uh, who knows for for the rest of my professional career? And I, I guess I decided, no, I didn't. Uh, but I was very I was good at research, right? But I also wanted to interact with students and do some teaching and some interact, you know, some more human interaction in that sense, right? So where where else to do that? But a research university, right? So so I actually applied back to MIT uh, to uh, the only place or or one of I well remember. no it was the f it was the first place I explored my my plan was if MIT hadn't worked out I was probably going off and explored some place like Princeton or some other place like that right <laughs> right so. had you taught while you were here as a graduate student no actually at that time um, you know in the aero department and it's still the case actually there there was no expectation that. As a so PhD it's a little student bit of a shot in the dark about would you like teaching or not, and yeah. would you be good at it? Well, p people told me I was good at explaining things to them, right? So you're right, but it was a, it was a bit of a shot in the dark, right? So I, although I knew I wanted to spend more time interacting with 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 students, right? But you know re whether or not I'd be any good at teaching or enjoying it, I I didn't know, right? So, so anyway, I applied here and came came back here to MIT. And do you think that your career or the way you approached anything um, in research or interacting management was different from other people at MIT who simply had stayed in academe their whole time? The fact that you'd been out mm -hmm. in the business world and in a national lab mm -hmm. did that give you a different perspective? Do you think? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I I seen the people here, the the lifers, the ones who be as undergraduates, graduate students, and so on. You know, this this sense of MIT as a great place, that's good. But 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 you know, a str also a very strong sense of hubris. You know, <laughs> you know, the MIT is there's no other there's no better place than MIT, and there's no other way to think about things than the way you think about it here. Yeah, and I I've been out of here several times, right? And I, there are lots of other ways to think about things. You know, right. So. But it's not just, there are people who've been in academe their whole lives, even if they haven't been at MIT the whole time. Mm -hmm. And so the notion of just being used to a university setting, um, whether yeah. or not it's MIT. Yeah, well, yeah but, but I would say, well, I, I did learn quite a bit about being outside of academia, but, but you realize being in a national lab is, it's a bunch of researchers, right? I mean, to, the, the, the culture to first order there is not significantly different than the culture you'll find here in a big research lab, like you know, our research lab for electronics or something like that. Right? I mean, the fact that one is a national lab and one is a university is doesn't matter. Although so things like funding are certainly different, and the that, question of who's going to pay for what and that's how true. it's determined. No, that's true. No, that, that's correct. And I mean, the balance. Yeah, I mean, the national you need lab to basically teaching versus yeah. research and committees. no, but in the bi in the big research labs here, the research staff don't think about teaching; they don't teach. I mean, but you, but you're right; they do. They are responsible for bringing in their funding, and that that means they have a certain go for the jugular attitude. You know, whereas whereas in the national labs, basically the national labs get money from the federal government. You know, and so the re at the level of an individual researcher. You're not thinking about where your funding is coming from. I mean, you just have it, right? How much of a shock was that in needing to start finding your own funding? Well, that payment? that was a shock. I mean, that's so so coming back to MIT now as an assistant professor, right? So I was you know, I was told very clearly 
you know, you need to go out and, you know, raise money to, uh, you know, support your research enterprise. So I had to quickly learn the skill of writing proposals, you know, marketing the proposals, you know, identify who to market them to, and then, you know, bringing in research money as well. Then, of course, the supervising students, which I'd never personally done. Of course, I'd been supervised, but I'd never supervised it. You know, student. So actually, all of those skills I had to figure out how to do. Right? How so much help did you get? Did, did some. Did you have any kinds of lessons or seminar for young professors and uh, actually, how to find research? At that, at that time, no. It's something that actually MIT does do now. But, but the, the attitude at that time, so this was 1985, right? Okay. It, it, was, it was well summed up to me by a former department head who said, our attitude is we throw you in the deep end, think of the deep end of a pool, okay? If you swim, you should be here. <laughs> and if you sink, well, <laughs> you sounds like how they used to look at witches in yeah. Salem. Yeah, right. right, 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 right. It was fairly Darwinian attitude to, to life. So, yeah, so I got a little bit of help. One of my colleagues um, helped initialize me by giving me a, a graduate student on some funding he had. I, I had another colleague who gave me some tips on on teaching, uh, which was, you know. Such was, as what? Do you remember those tips? Yeah, well, pay attention to how the students are reacting. And if they don't understand something, go back and explain it to them, a few things like that. Right? How were you supposed to know whether they understood? Well, you look at their homeworks and their, uh -huh. their, the expressions in their faces, basically. Right? Uh, no homeworks, you know. So uh, there was a little bit of that, okay. uh, but but compared to what we do now, it was kind of really basic stuff, you know. Right. And did you start with classes that were undergraduate or graduate or both? Well, I you know I was the the normal teaching load here is 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 one class a semester. So I I was actually assigned initially an undergraduate class to teach uh, uh, right after I came here, which was rocket propulsion. And then, as I recall, I developed my own graduate class. I just don't remember exactly when I developed it, but, but yeah, so I was teaching one undergraduate, one graduate class. The graduate class being my particular area of specialty, actually. So as you leaned back and took stock after your first year, <laughs> Did you say, what have I gotten myself into? Or did you say, boy, is this great? It's everything I dreamed about, or well, some mix? <laughs> it, it was mixed. It was, it, it was challenging, uh, because I, I said I had to learn a new, a new set of skills, particularly around you know, writing proposals. Or a couple new sets yeah. of skills. Yeah, writing proposals, teaching. supervising, student teaching. Not, not about doing research. I knew how to do research, right? But about supervising others and, and teaching and and selling the research to bring in money. And, you know, I, I ended the first year, I'd, I'd had some success. I brought in some money. I started with some students, although initially it, my, my choice of students wasn't, wasn't that good. This is graduate students yeah. who wanted to work yeah. with you. Yeah, my choice of students wasn't, wasn't that good. So I, I had some initial problems with some of the students because I didn't quite know how to supervise them, you know, appropriately. Um, so I, I, I ended the year kind of, I would say, I got through it. it. It was mixed. The teaching was a little rocky, you know, initially. I, I, I remember very distinctly at the end of the first semester. Uh, you remember I was trained as a mathematician, so mathematicians like to use the word obvious, you'd say. So in some ways, obvious, QED, right? And at the end of the semester, I had a student come to me and say, never use the word obvious again. Because <laughs> he said, it may have been obvious to you, but it wasn't obvious to us. You know, right? So you know, I learned from these, these kind of things. And it got better over time. Right? How much sense of community did you feel at MIT when you came back? Or were you pretty much in a silo of your department? Oh, at the level of being an assistant professor, I was in silo in my department, right? I mean, I interacted with other assistant professors and with, you know, faculty in the department, students there, but other than that, you know, in the fact that there was a broader institute, I couldn't have told you. 
I couldn't have told you who the president was. <laughs> or when the, did you start? <laughs> or anything else. Like, well, there was a president? Who was that? You know? <laughs> I didn't even know who the dean was, actually. I couldn't have told you any of this stuff, right? right. I knew the department had <laughs> I mean, that's the life of an assistant professor, you know. I appreciate. And so that. it changed after you received tenure, or? Well, I I, I suppose over over time. Um, two, uh, I mean, two things happened, right? I mean, one is that uh, over time, you know, th this is a place where there's lots of opportunities, right? So, so what happened over time is that. I, I, there were opportunities to become involved in some bigger things here at MIT. So, in particular, I got involved in the in the space grant program. I, I actually wrote the initial proposal here and brought it into MIT. So, so MIT became a so-called space grant institution. This is when NASA. you were still an assistant professor, yeah, yeah. early. Yeah, right. But not not the first year. This was like the third year. Okay. Uh, but then, uh, what what also happened is uh, over time that. Um, you know, well, I, you know, I, n I know how these things work now, but, but my, I, I was invited to be on some um, uh, committees associated, in this case, since I was doing space-related work, you know, with, with what was going on in the space business, particularly NASA. So I was invited to be on some national committees, right? Now, you know, it, it, since I know how this, this works, you know, I, I understand that those invitations didn't come out of the blue, right? They came out because you know some senior professors in the department suggested to people in you know positions of power, why don't you think about this guy? You know, as, as they were looking for uh, people to be on on you know various committees. And right? that's one of the benefits of being at MIT. It is. At least like MIT. It is. You know, there's 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 a lot of networking ability and the connections of you know, very high. And I mean, I, I do it now myself. I mean, I get people all the time asking me, would you recommend somebody for this, that, or the other thing? And, you know, and then you get into these positions, uh, in these committees, and as long as you do a reasonable job, you say semi-intelligent things, right? And you do a reasonable job, you know, people, you get to know people and then they'll suggest you for other things. And so, you know, kind of broaden. So, so you know, so basically over time, th this is what was actually happening. My, my exposure to things at MIT was going up, and my exposure to things kind of on the the national stage, particularly you know in kind of the aerospace world, you know, w was also going up, right? And, and that actually, the, the end result of that was I was asked to be chief scientist of the United States Air Force, right? Which is obviously a kind of a, it was actually a major position in Washington that has a big, you know national purview about what the United States Air Force is actually doing. Were you surprised uh, when you were approached for that? Actually, I, 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 I was surprised. Yeah, yeah, right. So, but, you know, something I said or did impress the Chief of Staff of the Air Force enough that, uh, you know, he decided he wanted me to come work for him. Right? What were those two years like? Uh, what did you work on and who did you report to and were you Really, sort of a professional in a big department or a manager. Or right. Well, the 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 job of chief scientist is is a direct report to the chief of staff and the secretary of the air force. So th those are the two senior jobs in the, in the air force. Obviously, chief of staff is the military guy, and the secretary is the civilian guy, right? And and so it's a direct report. And and in, in a military system, which is what the air force is, that, that has a great deal of meaning. I mean, much much more so than here, right? Because you know, it's a hierarchical system, right? I mean, here somebody might be a direct report to to the president, and people say, "Oh, that's nice." <laughs> you know, who cares? Right? Because everybody has their own opinion. But but there, it's a military system. You know, they they kind of respond very closely to what it is that uh, these people at the top actually say, you know, and do. So so you know, so the job I had there as a direct report was to advise those two individuals on on more generally on issues of science and technology obviously relevant to the Air Force, um, to advise them on the health of the Air Force research apparatus, you know, which, which was executing a couple billion dollars worth of research, right? You know, to be a general spokesman for what the Air Force was actually doing in those areas, right? So, um, Did they care much about science and technology? Actually, they did. What were the big issues that oh, uh, they were facing the department that you had a weigh in on? Well, one of them was, uh, th this was 1997, so one of them was what should be the position of the United States Air Force about, but let's call it space in general, right? So 
ne never, you know, never mind that, of course, space had been part of the United States Air Force back to the beginning. I think the reality was, if you looked at the funding, space was started with a small s and air started with a big A. <laughs> so, you know, part of my job was to help advise them on how to make the S bigger and and more be more, at least at the level of science technology, be more strategic about what they're actually doing, right? Uh, so I, I, I did that. I was asked to give a lot of advice upon their investment in directed energy weapons, which I did, you know. Um, so, now I'll tell you one of the things I found very quickly, right, there. Uh, I mean, two things. I, I arrived in September, and uh, uh, in October I was sitting in a meeting with a whole bunch of generals, and we were talking actually about a, uh, a, a space-based laser system. And uh, it, after a while it struck me that the numbers they were throwing out were billions of dollars. And they were sitting there saying, what do you think about this? Should we invest here? Should we do that? And, and they were asking my opinion about literally billions of dollars. And I realized, since they were clearly waiting for me to say something you know, intelligent, right? That you know, that, you know, I, I, uh, things I said could cause this shift of substantial amounts of money. I mean, much more money than I'd ever seen at MIT, right? <laughs> I mean, just a different scale that they operated on. Right? And and the other thing I, I quickly appreciated was that since I was primarily dealing with generals, who are, whose major background is is humanities, by the way and dealing with uh, the civilians, the major background was law. So they're lawyers. Again, mainly humanities kind of backgrounds, right? Uh, I mean, these are the people in leadership in Washington, right? Uh, you know, I was not by and large dealing with people whose background was science and technology. So uh, I very quickly discovered uh, I had to talk to them in their language. I couldn't talk to them in my language. Back right. to communication. Yes, I had. I, my, part of my job was just to translate, you know, for them. Here's what this actually means in their language, not in my language, right? Right. right. Uh, but you also had to know the scientific answers and the trade-offs. Yeah. So I, I had to be careful that what I said was actually technically accurate, in a way that my colleagues here wouldn't say, "What are you saying?" You know, <laughs> but 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 also but but put it in a frame that they could understand. Right. How did you get up to speed in knowing the answers? In other words, all of a sudden you were faced with this system or that and hmm. lots of reading. These weren't things you were thinking about or no, studying. No. Lots of MIT. reading and also, you know, there are lots of people who work in the Air Force Research Establishment. Find good people and go talk to them, right? So so to give an example, I mean I I, I I was there to help advise them about space related investments. Now I know something about the space business having worked in it for you know quite a few years but but they also want a lot of advice about directed energy what did i know about directed energy right i mean i know how laser works i understood the basic directed energy means yeah but well, primarily lasers uh, also microwaves but primarily lasers right i mean so i understood the basic physical concepts but at level of detail i mean i had to go learn this stuff so i i read i talked to the people in the research apparatus who knew in detail and i knew enough physics uh, and mathematics so I could communicate with them and then uh, then I had to take what they told me and translate it so that I could now communicate with people whose background was not not you know was, was basically humanities right but was smart I'm not gonna say these people aren't smart right. you know I remember very very distinctly having a conversation with the secretary of the Air Force uh, who was, was a lawyer and very smart guy. He asked a lot of smart questions. I said to him once, so, his name was Whit Peters, Whit, how do you manage to ask a smart question given that you actually don't know anything technical? Which he admitted, you know. Yeah. He said, Harvard Law School. Harvard Law School taught me how to take a case and, you know, deconstruct it, you know, and argue some a different case. And, you know, and just, as he said, that's the only skill I'm applying, right? In this <laughs> hierarchy, did, did MIT carry some weight, the fact that you were not just the chief scientist, but you were chief scientist with a doctorate from MIT who taught at MIT? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they, you know, they first sort of assumed I knew what I was talking about. So my job was to make sure I, I didn't mislead them. You know. <laughs> did, did your experience in Washington change your view of engineering or engineering education or science education? Oh, and immensely. So how? Immensely. Because, you know, 
it, it, it wasn't just the experience of Washington, but the experience with these these uh, committees I worked on. You know, w w uh, over time leading up to this, so I, I was on the space station advisory committee for NASA. I was on the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board for the Air Force. I was on um, some o some other you know large committees. But so when I when I was doing my my research, right, working my graduate students on detailed, I said I was saying earlier, triple integrals some extremely detailed mathematics, you know, at physics, right? Um, and, and so then, but then I go to these, these committee meetings, you know, with some of these people. And, you know, when, when you're dealing with the space station or you're dealing with the NASA Advisory Council, which I was on, or Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, you end up interacting with the leadership of these institutions. So, you know, that's how I got to know Chief Staff of the Air Force, because I was on the Air Force Scientific Advisory Board, right? And you know what I what I quickly discovered is they never ask questions like how do I do this triple integral <laughs> <Yeah>. or <laughs> tell me how to solve this differential equation. <laughs> yeah. They never ask questions like that. They ask questions that were fundamentally at the strategy, policy, economics level, right? So you know that that broadened my thinking substantially. I, I, you know because that was the world that they moved in and had to move in and. I realized that there was just a different world out there, and, and engineers like me, you know, had to be able to, to, I'm not saying every engineer, but some anyway, have to be able to move and communicate and understand the issues in this world, to articulate the case for and to actually build, you know, complex systems that that are likely to be accepted and to actually work. So, so that actually broadened my thinking, you know, th that set of experiences. You're very, very. Uh, you know, substantially. I mean, much more so than anything I ever learned at MIT. I can tell you. If you were going through MIT again, or if you knew then what you know now, would you have changed the way you went about your own education? Yeah, I probably would have. I actually, I've, I've never thought about that because I, I can't go backwards, right? I mean, I, right. I can, I can continue to to learn, which is what I what I try to do. But yeah, I probably would have, yes. I probably would not have been s taken so, so many very detailed things, but you know, you, you don't know that at the time. But maybe taken a few more policy courses yeah. or economics yeah. courses. Yeah. Which is really what you got into when you came back to MIT in yeah. terms of the Actually, I, I should have taken economics course. I mean, every piece of economics I've learned is only on the job learning, <laughs> right? right? I sometimes think I should go take 1401 and 1402 here. That's why I, I because I know the students Some take it. Some professors do that, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, right, right, They right. go and take yeah. 701 and so yeah. they know a little bit. So while. if ever I got the time to have a sabbatical, maybe that's what I'll do. <laughs> you know, go take one, you know, these courses where I can actually learn them. But you're right. I mean, when I, when I came back, I was involved much more at the kind of the strategy policy level, let's say. Yeah. And you realize how important economics is there very quickly, actually. And you became involved with the engineering systems division. Well, first you became involved with the technology and policy program. Right? Yeah, that, that was because you know when I when I returned here, which was 1999. Um, so, I mean, two things were going on simultaneously. On, on the one hand, uh, Richard Enoughville, who'd run the technology and policy program, actually created it, had done it for 25 years, and and wanted to uh, step down appropriately. I've, after you know, creating this wonderful thing, and so so the institute, in this case, the School of Engineering, was actually looking for you know new leadership there. But the other thing was that uh, I, what happened to me when I came back was what what has happened to a number of people who've ended up, who've who've served in Washington, which is you know you you go from here you're you're doing your narrow deep thing. And you go, you go there, and you, you you operate at a much broader level, and there's good and bad to that, um, and you know, and you're dealing with kind of big picture stuff, and then then you return here, right, and and you know the, the normative path of the institution doesn't know quite what to do with you, right, so <laughs> so it, this this is well summed up by my my running to a colleague of mine shortly after I came back here, so I, I you know I've been two years in Washington. 
being over to the White House, hobnobbed with all those people and doing all this, you know, this interesting stuff. And also because, see, I've, I've flown all over the world, I'd, you know, been on all kinds of jets and played with their toys, you know. And so I run into a colleague and he says, haven't seen you in a while. Been on sabbatical, you know, <laughs> 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 writing a book or something. I said, no. <laughs> you know, you know, and so, you know, I, I was looking for some set of, some different thing to do at MIT than what I'd done before because what was very apparent to me is that I, what I didn't want to do was just have a periodic career, right? That is return to exactly what I was doing before, same office, same class, you know, nothing had changed, right? As, as if you have this experience and nothing changes. So, so I, I was looking for new horizons, frankly, when I, when I came back here. And, you know, and they, so they offered me the opportunity to lead the technology and policy program because Dinofield was stepping down. So. Did you think about going somewhere other than MIT into a different type of institution or even a different university? Yeah. I, no, I, I actually I said very clearly, uh, not to a lot of people because I didn't want to threaten anybody, right? But, uh, you know, if I didn't find some other avenue within a year, I'd leave, right? And, you know, and, and the reality is Chief Science of the Air Force, former Chief I had lots of opportunities, so, you know, I could have done that. Because right? you found that in the end, Although you had been fascinated by engineering and science types of problems before you went to, to Washington, that you were even more interested in a different set of problems that you had begun to recognize in the years leading up to Washington and yeah. then crystallized yeah. in yeah. Washington. Yeah, well, that's, good. that's a good way to say it. So, so, the so, you know, they offered me the technology policy program, which is very interesting. I, you know, taking over from somebody who'd run it for 25 years, I mean, I, I had to re-vector it fairly substantially, you know, which is what I did. In what way and, and why? In other words, where, where had it been and, and what prompted you to, to re-vector it? Well, it, but one of the things, obviously, when somebody's run it for 25 years, he, Richard had done a great job, but it very singly reflected his vision. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. But can you articulate what that vision was and, and sort of where you thought it needed to head next? It, it needed to specifically uh, attract many more faculty to be involved with it because he was the only faculty member that was actually involved with that program. And it needed very specifically to have a much bigger national presence so, uh, you know, that, that he had brought it to. Right. So, okay. So, I mean, I took those under advisement. I got, by the time I ended, there were nine faculty involved with the program. We, we ran a big national symposium on, you know, what science advisors the president had done, which set off a whole set of different things. So, you know, I pushed up the national presence very substantially. Right. And the graduate the program had been giving out master's degrees, I think. Yeah, and maybe still does. You added a, a doctorate during. Well, the no, the doctorate. The doctorate was added before my time. Now, what I did actually do is, I, uh, I, I ran the technology and policy program, and then I was asked to, you know, run the engineering systems division, which was the meta division, which actually contained the technology and policy program. And what I did do is in that is we created a new PhD program called the ESD PhD program. And, and they, there was a previous existing PhD program called TMP, Technology Management Policy, and we, we, we subsumed that into this bigger PhD program. So, so, we, we took, we, so TMP pre-existed me, but nevertheless, I think we, we took it and made it a lot more focused. Um, and how, how many students a year were you graduating, say, with doctorates, and what kind of discipline were they graduating with? How much was engineering and how much was economics or political science or anything else? So uh, I, I think at the time TMP was running like five students a year and, and it's now running more like about 15 or so uh, students a year are graduating from it. So the, the mental model we, we argued was what I call the pi model. So think of pi as pi, right? Two legs and cross cutting. <laughs> so we we wanted them to the students to have expertise in some technology discipline, some discipline of engineering or more technically oriented discipline, and then that's one leg. Which they would come in with. 
Yeah, and which and they could deepen. And then another leg would be uh, some social science or uh, you know management um, kind of discipline. And then the cross cutting the top of the pie will be the focus upon some complex system where they bring these two kind of disciplinary foci to bear on that uh, on that complex system. Right. So. Um, so th that was the mental model behind the, the, the broader PhD that we eventually you know, we established. That was the ESD PhD. That all sounds very logical. I wonder what the market is and what the career paths are for people like this. They probably wouldn't get hired as engineering professors at MIT in course 16 or most of the other courses. Well, actually, actually no. It's no? Not a we, we have, in, in terms of graduates of the program, they've gone to a number of different things, right? Some have gone to industry, as you might expect. Uh, actually, in industry, they're, they're perceived to be quite valuable because they have multiple disciplinary specialties and understanding, as well as a broader ability to think in a system sense. Some of them have actually gone to academia. A number of the graduates have actually been hired at CMU, uh, and they, they have a similar kind of unit, the Engineering Public Policy Unit. We've had, uh, we have actually hired graduates here at MIT in the departments, right? But whereas you have hundreds of engineering professors at MIT, you, you have a very much smaller number of professors of, of this area, yes. right? Yes, right. So but, but remember, you know, the, here at MIT, the, what was happening at the same time was the establishment of the engineering systems division. And the argument that MIT actually needed to hire some people who, in engineering, who were who were broader. Right. Yeah. So I mean, they, they, I they wonder what their career paths. Were. I mean, would these people have the option as you did to become a chief scientist? It's interesting that the chief scientist, in the end, had to know a lot about non-science techniques yes. of yes. analysis, yes. the economics. And yes. Yes. And yet, it's called. Scientist, yeah, not yeah, well, chief policy maker right. for science issues. That's right. Yeah, well, I guess that's conceivable. You could see people like that ending up in positions where, yeah, they. So you they, think they would still be able to move in a an arc like that, a position like sure. that? Sure. As well, yeah, but as well as do serious research in engineering. M more generally, coming back to the engineer of 2020, you know, the argument is that engineering itself to continue to be successful needs to change. There has to be some set of people, not, not the majority, who understand how to you know, articulate the case for engineering in a broader mm -hmm. socio-technical context, right? So you could have some of the people who say, yeah, boy, I, I, have, I have knowledge, I have expertise in more than one world, right? So it's what some people call holistic engineering, if you want to think about it that way. I guess the interesting question, and, and one area that maybe there's been some debate about is how much that engineering component has to be of that of that holistic total, and and how much you need to keep doing to to be cutting edge enough, or or to be able to understand the others who are. Well, the, you've got to keep doing some of it. So now, in the reality is, even in a traditional engineering degree, we can't teach it, people everything they need to know. So actually, for everybody. What you really have to teach them is, you know, learn how to learn, right? You keep, you just constantly keep on learning, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, even in if you're in, say, microelectronics or something else like that, or, or right, or, you know, control theory, right? You just have to keep on learning, right? What has been the acceptance at MIT and particularly within the engineering school of? the division and, and the cross-cutting and so forth. It took a while to get it accepted, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is an interesting story. You know. um, it, it, I, and it, let, let me answer that in a couple of different ways. One of the things the, the division did was it uh, took over these four uh, degree programs, the Technology and Policy Program, the leaders, what was then called Leaders for Manufacturing, now called Leaders for Global Operations, System Design and Management Program, and the Ma Master of Logistics Program. Uh, and uh, each of those programs 
was created actually in response to a need as expressed from industry or government. I mean, the, the TPP was a need as expressed from government. The rest of it needs, needs as expressed by industry. That is, they were driven by external needs. Okay? In each case, uh, in the, before the existence of the Engineering Systems Division, the, the, the response in the School of Engineering was, you know, that's, that's good, but that's for some, it's not for this department, it's not for this department, it's for some other department over there, right? So, so you had this funny situation where, where the school was saying, let's focus upon our disciplinary kind of specialties, and the outside world was saying, we have a need for people who are educated in this, this kind of more broad way, right? Uh, so, what, so what the engineering systems division actually did was it, 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 and it created the meta structure for these programs to actually thrive. In. I mean, before that, they were living on the margins. I mean, that's why you know in TPP there was one faculty member in it, right? And after ESD, they were no longer living on the margins. So, you know, in that sense, I think there was there was broad recognition in the school that something needed to be done. That that we couldn't have a set of programs which were clearly responses to what occurred to a need, but w which were housed nowhere, right? They just floated in the School of Engineering. Mm -hmm. Now, so in th that kind of acceptance actually has come, I think, you know, I'm not going to say trivially, but relatively easily. Right? Now, what the, what the Engineering Systems Division also did is propounded a broader notion, right? That there's an intellectual discipline behind complex systems, where, where by complex systems are meant systems broadly defined to include particularly the intersection of technical and social and political and economic issues. So that's why it's called socio-technical issues uh, interfacing in the system. You know, it's manifestly true that these systems exist. You think of something like the big dig here in the Boston area, you think of the air traffic control system, um, you think of the, the uh, the, the World Wide Web, not, not just the Internet, but the World Wide Web, uh, and, and you see all these complex systems which have technical pieces and also social pieces and, and policy and economic pieces, and they all interact, right? So that's a manifestly true statement. You know, and e even the most diehard engineering scientists couldn't dispute the existence. <laughs> you know, the, the, the question that, that has led to whether or not the you know, some, some of the issues around the Engineering Systems Division is whether or not there was an intellectual discipline associated with these complex systems, right? And what do you think? Well, I, I think, frankly, you know, the, the jury is still out on that one, right? Um, in my, in my own personal feeling, the jury is still out. You know, there are, there are people who argue there is indeed an intellectual discipline, and by doing research in a coherent way, we'll, we'll find it. There are other people who argue, some of my colleagues from Sloan say, for example, that there is no intellectual discipline of management. Right? There, are, there are things that people teach in management schools, so they teach a bit of psychology, teach a bit of economics, right? teach a bit of organizational theory, but there's no overarching discipline of management. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can see both points of view. Right. Right? Right. Um, there, okay. there used to be a a concern or a debate at MIT about whether MIT was graduating enough leaders or whether it was only graduating people who would go into staff jobs. Yes. I don't know whether that's dropped away as maybe admissions have shifted yeah. somewhat and as MIT has embraced more leadership training, yeah. I mean, it has various programs, and as perhaps you educate students differently, yeah. is, is I, that I've, I've a, certainly a heard different? the rhetoric about that go down. Now, now, what is true, as you just said, is that we have actually, at the undergraduate level, put in place a whole set of programs that emphasize leadership. Um, you know, there's a so-called community catalyst program. We we emphasize what students can do outside of the classroom to show leadership. We, the, in the School of Engineering, there's a structured set of courses they can take, so the Gordon Leadership Program, uh, and a structured set of experiences they can do. So, so you know, we, we have actually responded to that. So, I, so the, I, I, now whether or not, I don't know what the cause and effect is here. Yeah. Certainly, certainly the rhetoric seems to have, you know, have gone down, right? Uh, I mean, it's not that there weren't MIT grads who 
didn't go out and found big companies and take leadership positions in lots of ways, and yet that was a, an undercurrent for a long time. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Now, and I, I would say also our emphasis on the fact that we have explicitly turned up the emphasis on communications has helped because a, a, a necessary but not sufficient condition to be a good leader is to be able to communicate what you're saying to others. <laughs> I mean, you can communicate and not be a good leader, but it's hard to think of a leader who can't communicate. Right? <laughs> what at this point is your agenda for the Dean of Undergraduate Education Office in terms of curriculum and continued reshaping challenges yet to be uh, dealt with uh, for undergraduate education at MIT? So th there's a number of things that, that we're pursuing. We're, we're continuing to pursue the development of global educational opportunities for our students because we see a modern education, a 21st century education, as having our students out there in the world. I mean, not just in the United States, but in the rest of the world. Right. Uh, we, we are continuing to pursue and to make sure that all of our students um, have the uh, let's call it good outcomes associated with their with their education. So uh, it, it it is the case that some of our um, especially minority students don't have such this exactly the same outcomes as as the rest of the students. So we need we continue to understand that and develop that. Um, we, I I would say one of the things we're going to spend a fair amount of time on in the future is is trying to understand how the pedagogy in our education needs to evolve in light of the growth of online education. Right. So, you know, we we did open courseware some ten years ago, and that in some ways we kind of backed into open courseware, and it's. It's done a number of interesting things that we didn't completely appreciate at the time. And here we are 10 years later, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what has it done for us and where are we going with it? And, and what's the next step in terms of our use of online materials in our educational system? So, and, and you just see things continuing to evolve in the, kind of the, in the, in the digitally native students that we're admitting. Right, and and their use of uh, you know online kind of media, right? So, I I think that's likely to have a fair impact on what we do. I mean, are we going to be the same ten years from now, f fifteen years from now as we are today? I don't think so. But exactly how we're going to change, I have some ideas. But we need to explore this in a way that such as what? Well, you know, I I guess my thinking and and actually the provost thinking as we discuss this is we we will probably move more to a, what we call a hybrid mode of education. Right? Now, you know, MIT has a lot of, of of direct interaction with students and faculty, which, which is good. Okay, uh, but but it's also the case by using computer mediated tutorial systems. You know, we can more personalize uh, how fast students actually learn. You know, by presenting to them in ways that uh, are going to the pace that they're actually able to learn and present that to the faculty. And there have been some interesting experiments at CMU which have actually shown this fairly effectively. Uh, it, it's also the case, of course, that there's great material that exists on the web. I mean, you know, open courseware is one place, but there are other places, right? So, you know, we, we've got to ask the question, I mean, why do we continue, continually reproduce the same material when it's already out there? <laughs> yeah. right. So, so I think we'll end up evolving to something which is some kind of hybrid between direct interaction as we have now and, and use of online education. And where that balance is, I don't yet know, right? That's what we have to figure out. There had been a fairly long and involved efforts to make some changes to the curriculum, mm. um, a few of which went through and most of which or some of which didn't. Mm. What do you think? Will will there be an another effort to change curriculum? What again, if you could wave a wand, would would you change? Yeah, if anything. Well, so, so those are two completely different questions. Right? Okay. So will there be another effort to change the curriculum? I I don't think so in the, in the short term. Not, Not short term, the next few years, because you know. 
boy, it's a huge amount of energy, faculty energy and time to, to do these things, right? So, you know, we took a run and some things didn't pass. So are we going to run again? I doubt it, right? Now, now you are seeing some changes continue to occur. So in the School of Engineering, they came up with these flexible engineering degrees. We think that's a good thing, right? School of Humanities will, will have its much more focused year for the... For the which is the part that did pass. Yeah, right? which is the part. That, that's, that's a good thing, right? So, you know, we'll, somehow we'll integrate more online stuff everywhere, and that's probably a good thing too, right? And we'll integrate more global education, and those, those are good things. So, you know, I mean, all those things are, are, are uh, pushing in the right direction, right? Um, but but I, I don't see any F big effort to make big changes again. I, actually, with, with the ability we put in place for students to do double um, majors, we, we created the ability for a lot of flexibility on the part of students, right? And one of the things that we have learned is, you know, watch where the students go. So let, let's see what they do, right? Maybe afterwards we'll get in front of them. And do the ones who double major have even less time for the kind of reflection you were talking Actually, about? they do. <laughs> they do. You know, the culture of this place tends to encourage these students to pack their days, just pack them, you know. Uh, so I can only hope the reflection occurs some other time because it's not occurring during the time they hear. Right? Well, we've packed our time, and uh, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, uh,